Hey everybody, my name is Gabriel and I'm going to be discussing Genesis 4 etymologies today. So, first things first, let's look at the slide. And you're going to see where it says that we're going to start by comparing Genesis 2, verse 10, the four heads from the river, to Daniel chapter 7, verse 2, the four beasts from the sea. Uh, now this seems like a pretty interesting comparison. I mean, most people, when they think of the prophecies of the four beasts, they don't think about comparing them to the four heads of the rivers mentioned in the Garden of Eden. So, it's already starting out on a pretty uh, heavy, let's say, uh, complicated point of view. Uh, so, let's look at Genesis 2. So, there are four heads. So, the name of the first is Pison. That it is the one that compasseth the whole land of Havilah. You'll notice that I'm highlighting the names on the PowerPoint for the ones that we'll be discussing. And it says Havilah is where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good, and the bedellium and the onyx stone. And then it goes on to the name of the second river, which is Gihon. And this is the same one that comes as Ethiopia. So the third river is Hidekel, uh, or you could say Hidekel, however you wish to say it. And this goes towards the east of Assyria. And the fourth is the Euphrates River. So those are our four rivers. Now let's look at Daniel 7. It's talking about the first year of Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, where Daniel has a dream. And he's on the bed, and then he wrote down the dream, and he tells the sum of the matters, it says. So, verse 2, Daniel spoke and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea. Notice how it's underlined, strove upon the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. So this is an interesting comparison. First you have the uh, four rivers rivers that compass the whole land of Havilah, and now you have the four winds of the heaven striving upon the great sea. It's, a, it, it's an interesting comparison. Then let's go to on the next part of the page, Genesis 4, 17 and 18. So it talks about Cain and his wife and how she conceives and has Enoch. And he goes on to build a city. And they call the city Enoch after the sun. So Enoch is underlined. And from Enoch, you get Irad, which is also underlined, who you also get Mahujael. So each of these names are going to be important later on. So Genesis 2 4 mentions four heads. The line of Cain has five heads. And Mississippi, just an example, has five heads. So you have five names, five heads. This is just a comparison, thinking of like if we're thinking about uh, rivers in today's world. And uh, here we have five heads on the Mississippi River. And you're not going to find that in many places elsewhere. So let's move to the next slide. So the next slide we have uh, comparing the Pison to the land of Shinar. So we go from comparing the four rivers to the four beasts in Daniel to the Pison in 
uh, Shinar. So we're sticking with the Four Rivers, but now we're going to go to the Shinar. Why? Well, the reason we're looking at these two particular places is because this is a study of etymology. And we're looking at the original definitions of these words that were originally in Hebrew that were translated into English. So now we're looking at the definition of the words that were translated into English. So if we look at the etymology of the Pishon, otherwise known as the Pison, well, we'll see that in Hebrew, the name Pishon could be derived from meaning to spring about or to be scattered. Scattered. That's underlined. Then if you go down looking at the excerpts from Aberim publications and the, their biblical dictionary, you're going to see the verb, I'm not sure how to say that in Hebrew, but it means to break apart or scatter. And so does this verb's biform. And the noun describes a scatterer or disperser. So everything's about scattering and someone who does the scattering and dispersing. Now, there also goes to uh, another identical verb. The same one may also describe overflowing springs or cities. So if you think about to the last slide, we were talking about uh, the different cities that were made, like the city of Enoch. Um, then up there's the verb that appears to have the same meaning as that uh, other definition meaning to scatter. And there's also another identical one that means describe the darting about of young calves. So it's kind of like a stampede, spreading out. Now, when you think of scattering, there's another story in the Bible that talks about scattering. Uh, actually, several, to be honest. Like, for example, Jesus where he was uh, talking to his disciples before he was risen up to heaven. Uh, they were scattered across the rest of the world to go share the gospel. Um, then you have the Tower of Babel, where the people are dispersed because of a language bearer, barrier. So there's a few things here. Um, if you go down to the bottom of the left, uh, it goes on to say uh, that there is a sintu consisting of sim, meaning region, and bilu, meaning to shake or to tremble. So this is also part of that pishon, so to shake or to tremble. When I, whenever I think of shaking or trembling, you could think of an earthquake. Or, uh, it, think of the branch of David, think of a branch where you shake it and seeds scatter across the winds. So in the wind, it's carried to different distant areas where it is planted in foreign soil. Think of how prophecy mentions that uh, to Abraham that he shall be a sojourner in a foreign land. So, scattering. Now let's look at Shinar, or Shinar. I'm not sure how you wish to say it. I call it Shinar. Uh, so, the first meaning we see underlined is to break, tear through, or split. This obviously is a repeat of the general theme experiencing violence. Uh, then there's the meaning of horrid or disgusting. And then uh, if you go a little bit further, you're going to see a gate, gatekeeper, a porter. Um, then if you go a little bit further down, you're going to see uh, to split open, to break, casting out, um, spreading out into many different ways. So. It's very similar in uh, fashion. So let's move on to the next slide and continue this a little bit. So 
in Genesis 37, 33, we're going to continue comparing the Pishon to Shinar, torn to pieces. This is the definition we're looking at, torn to pieces. So in Genesis 37, 33, it says, Then he examined it and said, It is my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. So, torn to pieces in this case can be compared to the Pishon, which means to be scattered, or Shinar, which means to be torn to pieces. Then you can look at Ezekiel 22, verse 25, where it talks about there is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof, like a roaring lion ravening the prey. Ravening the prey is another way of tearing. So, tearing to pieces. And then uh, it goes on to talk about 27, where her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves ravening the prey, shed blood, and to destroy souls to get dishonest gain. And then verse 28, and the prophets have daubed them with untempered mortar. There's a reason I'm mentioning this untempered mortar. Uh, <clears throat> it will, if you think of Shinar and Pishon, the scattering, uh, Shinar is related to the Tower of Babel where they used mortar to make bricks. So keep that in mind. <coughs> then we have Hosea 5.14 For I am like a lion to Ephraim and like a young lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear them to pieces and then go away. Now I want you to compare this to Samson and him leaving the corpse of the lion only to return later to find a beehive. Now let's look at Judges 14 and go to verse 6. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he rent him as he would have rent a kid. And he had nothing in his hand. So here we're talking about, uh, I believe it's Samson, and uh, renting him, tearing him apart as if he was tearing apart a kid like a goat, not a child. Um, so whenever you're uh, doing sacrificial offerings in the Bible, they tear the goat or the kid goat. And then verse eight, after a time he returned to take her and he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion and behold, there was a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass of the lion. So this is what it was talking about over in reference to Hosea 5.14, where they tear them to pieces and then go away and find something left in the uh, corpse afterwards. So now uh, you'll notice an underlined portion uh, website for the Constellation Guide in reference to a place uh, a constellation known as Praesepi. So the Praesepi uh, constellation lies near the center of the Cancer constellation, which is roughly halfway between the bright stars Regulus in Leo, the Lion, and Pollux in Gemini, a beehive, and honey found in the carcass of the lion. Think Praesepi found in Leo. Praesepi is also called the manger constellation, which is another word for beehive. Interesting. So you have the beehive inside the Leo constellation for Regulus. So it, you're seeing how the biblical story of the Samson tearing the carcass of the kid and then later finding the beehive in the carcass. This is a reference to the stars. So it's a story of seasons. Okay, so let's go on to the next page. Oh, actually look at the bottom. You'll see the 
Gemini, the twins, Leo and the lion, and Orion, the hunter, and Canis, the major, Canis major being the dog. So all of these are related to this story. Next. So here you're going to see a picture of David slaying the lion and the bear. And at the top right, it's saying the following website is where you can find the information in the highlighted paragraph below. If you wish, you can pause it to go to that website and go see what I'm talking about. Um, then in blue, this was enough for David, Saul, however, tried to dissuade, he tried to dissuade him, but David said that he had slain a lion, the Leo constellation, which is a reference to Hercules' first labor, and a bear, which is a reference to Ursa Minor, I mean Major, which is directly north of the Leo constellation. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them. Saul then said, go. So David took five smooth stones, there are five winter months, out of the brook, Abel. This is a reference to Abel, or the zodiac. Brook. The reason I say it's a reference to Abel is when you look up the definition or etymology of Abel, it translates to mean brook. So it's a reference to Abel, the Zodiac, and then drew near the Philistine, who looked scornfully upon him. David, however, confiding in his strength, smote the Philistine. Philistine, one of the definitions of Philistine is winter, with the five stones. So five months, the smoking of the Philistone, Philistine, so it's a reference to the five months of winter smiting the land. So, this, you get the cutting off his head, the men of Israel shouted and pursued the Philistine to the gates of Ekron. So, Ekron means vacuity, or the end of the year at the spring equinox. So, this is where the wounded Philistine fell. Fell can also be a reference to the fifth instar of the locust cycle. Locust is a flying insect that uh, is referenced throughout many prophecies. So, where did this fifth instar come from of the locust? It's actually a, instars are referenced to a locust cycle. Um, and it's also reference to the five winter months cycle that I just mentioned above. So, moving on, after the fifth in sorrow cycle, you'll see here Saul was again lost, for he didn't know David. He asked Abner. Abner means father of light. This can be a reference to the sun at the spring, spring equinox. The captain, captain can translate to mean first, of the host, host can mean summer months, uh, whose son is youth. Abner answered, as thy soul live, O king, I cannot tell. Brought before Saul, David told him he was the son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite. So all of these highlighted greens and yellows and blues, uh, they're in reference to that website in orange. So basically I copied this from that website and then I sh looked up the definitions of these words and posted the definitions right beside where each of these underlying portions were in the paragraph. Now if you go to Luke 1 we're going to compare those retrogrades and five months of winter and stuff like that. So if you look at verse 24, you have, And after those days his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months. Pluto is in retrograde for about five months till the end of September. <coughs> this is a reference to that. Say, thus 
have the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me to take away my reproach among men. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, then it's Luke 1, 26. And in the sixth month, so sixth month is a reference to three months till John the Baptist is born, representing the Virgin Mary hiding for three months. So then the angel Gabriel was sent. This is during that Virgin Mary hiding for three months. So let's move on to the next portion of the slides. And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him, that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. Three months is equal to 2,160 hours, or 60 times 6 times 6 equals 90 days, equals 3 months, equals 3 lunar months. So, if you think about three lunar months, you'll see, I did some calculations, Mars retrograde is equal to 72 days, which is, uh, if you think of the number 72, three days is equal to 72 hours. 72 days is equal to two sets of 30-day periods and 12 days. Then you have three sets of 24 days, which is three days, three nights, equal, which is a comparison to three days and three nights, which is equal to six sets of 12. Um, so 12 hours of day and 12 hours of night is compared to six sets of 12 for three literal days. So then let's look at 72 plus 72, which equals to 144. So two sets of 72 hours, or three days, three nights. Think of it like that. It's a prophecy reference. So 72 plus 72 equals 144. And if you divide this by 360 degrees, uh, so 360 degrees, a 360 degree circle minus 144 is equal to 216. And 216 is a reference to 666, or 6 times 6 times 6. This is using numbers from Revelation. So uh, it's using biblical pro prophecy to do these calculations. Then uh, you have in gray the number 800. It's equal to the number of years that Jared had after he begat Enoch, so the number of years he lived after he begat Enoch in Genesis 5.19. So right below that, you have a website for a European hornet. European hornet colonies often contain 300 or more workers by September or October, but they reach a maximum of 800 to 1,000. So why do I mention these numbers, 300 and then 800? Well, these are references to ages. So the 800 was the number of years after he begat Enoch, but 300 is the number that Enoch lived after he begat Methuselah. So this is where these numbers are referencing to, and they're referencing to hornets which if you remember from the last slide, last slide, I started talking about the, uh, they weren't called hornets, but they were called uh, the instars of locust. So we started talking about locust in the last slide. And now I'm continuing how locust or hornets follow these numbers in Genesis and the etymologies. Uh, so now you'll also see how the number 300 is a reference to Samson, which we were talking about with the stars in the sky and refer refer reference to the Chrysophy constellation. So the number 300 ties into Samson in Judges 15, 4, and 5. 
Samson went out and caught 300 foxes, and he took them, uh, took torches, turned the foxes tail to tail, and fastened a torch between each pair of tails. So, the tying of the tails. This is also a reference to a constellation known as Pisces, where they have two fish where their tails are tied together. And uh, you'll see a picture of it in the bottom right hand corner. This is a reference to a lot of mythologies, uh, Greek mythologies. So let's continue to the next slide. You have Vesca Pisces. This is also a reference to the two tailed uh, tied together fish. So in the picture, you'll see the Vesca Pisces is formed from two overlapping circles. And then you'll notice another picture of several overlapping cir circles and a little flower in the midst of these circles. This flower is referenced as the Tree of Life, mentioned in the book of Genesis. So it's a mathematical symbol, um, which references in the book of Genesis as a tree of immortality or infinites. So it's everlasting. So if you look at Pisces, the dates for it are from February 19th to March 20th. And its symbol, of course, is the fish. But it also, if you look at the symbol, uh, it has two things like that and a line connecting them. Uh, it almost looks like a uh, pi symbol, symbol, S similar, but not quite. If you look at the uh, thing below this picture, it says 153 fish miracle, a measure of a fish, Archimedes principle, two squares equals lar one large rectangle. So you'll see a picture of the Pisces at the bottom and the two overlapping circles form a rectangle, a perfect rectangle in the center. And you'll see how the measurements on the right slide show the two circles where square root of three over one is the reference to the 153 fish. Now we're back to the comparing Python to Shinar. So in this one, uh, you're going to be looking at Havila to start off. Uh, so in the first start, you're going to see Havila can mean circular motions, sand, and it can also be a reference specifically to childbirth. And it references childbirth as being circular or rampant. And it also describes it in whirling dances. Now, if you remember in the first slide, we were talking about the four winds in reference to the four beasts in Daniel 2. Uh, Daniel 2. So here's that reference uh, of why Havilah is a reference to those four winds, because it's referencing childbirth, and it also is a reference to whirling dances. So, it also can mean might, strong, a dream. Think of, uh, we were talking about Joseph earlier, his renting of a coat, and he is known as the dreamer. Um, and it can also mean a cluster, like a cluster of grapes. So, look at Job 38, 31. You'll see, canst thou bind the cluster of the Pleiades, or loose the bands of Orion? Now we're still talking about stars. And the Pleiades and the Orion, they're also connected to that uh, Praesidy constellation, but we'll get to that. Uh, then, cyclone etymology. Uh, if you look at what a cyclone is, it's a circle, a wheel, or an encirclement. And then there's a picture. The picture makes you think of a mathematical symbol of phi, or the golden ratio. It, that's what it looks like, is the golden ratio. So let's move on to the next slide.
All right, continuing from the last slide, uh, we're going to continue to look at Havala and how it relates to childbirth. So uh, if you look at this slide, you're going to see uh, something called sacred geometry of human development. So sacred geometry is related to the Vesca Pisces that we were talking about with the overlapping circles and uh, this is a mathematical, uh, it's similar to cellular division, let's put it this way. Um, and you'll notice in this chart that they're uh, discussing, like over a seven day period, the uh, basically development of a child. And going from in the uterus to where the egg becomes uh, what's called a blastocyst uh, at 512 cells and uh, it ends up turning into a torus and it's the point at which the egg begins to develop and form human life. Uh, so basically it shows the path going from the sack all the way into its resting place in a period of seven days. And during this seven days while the egg is traveling, it's developing from day one as the original, just the uh, best Pisces one, uh, and then showing it splitting and splitting and splitting and splitting and splitting. Uh, by day three, it's at eight cell stage. Day four, 32 to 64 cells. Day five, 128 cells. And day six, 256 cells. Day seven, 512 cells. So this is where it reaches that torus. And if you look at the torus picture at the bottom, the purple thing, it, uh, mentions having lungs, a mouth, internal organs, and an anus. So it has a basically a top and a bottom. So uh, this seven days creation is also directly related to the Genesis 1 seven days, uh, Genesis 1 and 2. So now we're seeing how the four rivers I mentioned in the uh, Garden of Eden can also be related to childbirth. So let's continue. No. I'm trying to continue. All right. So in this slide, uh, where we're continuing from the Havala, Havala, we're going to be looking at the words gold, sea of glass, the river of water of life, crystal, bronze, and city. All of these are definitions drawn from those rivers. So let's look at them. So Isaiah 60, 17, instead of bronze, I will bring gold. And instead of iron, I will bring silver. And instead of wood, bronze. So we're going to be comparing bronze and gold, uh, iron and silver, and wood and bronze. Second Timothy 2:20. Now in a large house there will there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also vessels of wood and earthenware. So there's another continuation of these uh, materials. Then you look at Revelation 21, 18. The material of the wall was jasper, and the city was pure gold, like clear glass. So now we're seeing uh, gold is likened into clear glass. Now, if you uh, ever read Revelation, uh, we're going to be talking about a sea of glass. So let's continue. Job 37, hast thou... With him spread out the sky, which is strong, and as a molten looking glass. So here, 
we're seeing a molten looking glass. And just before we saw a pure gold like clear glass. Okay, so here we're seeing some more con connections. Then we're seeing Revelation 4, 6. And before the throne, there was a sea of glass likened to crystal. So here we're seeing that clear glass comparison with the sea of glass and crystal. And molten looking glass can also be compared to uh, the molten sea. So Revelation 22, and he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. So all of these are connected. Next you'll see Deuteronomy 9, 21, and we're going to compare this to 22, 1. And I took your sin, the calf, which ye had made, and burnt it with fire, and stamped it, and ground it very small, even until it was as small as dust. And I cast the dust thereof into the brook that descended out of the mount. So, Revelation 22, 1, proceeded out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. Let's look back at 9, 21, uh, brook that descended out of the mount. It's pretty clear uh, that there is a direct comparison. Um, John 4, 14, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst, but the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. Exodus 32, 20, let's compare that to 4, 14. Then he took the calf they had made, burned it in the fire, ground it to powder, and scattered the powder over the face of the water. There's that scattering. Remember Shinar and uh, Pison? Uh, then he forced the Israelites to drink it. So the water I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. Now Deuteronomy 9 talks about the calf which he had made and burnt it with fire, stamped it and ground it very small, and even into the small as dust. And I cast the dust thereof into the brook that descended out of the mount. So you have the calf, just like in Exodus 32, 20. You have it burnt with fire. So they burned the calf with fire in uh, 32, 20 ground it to powder. It's grounded into small dust in uh, Deuteronomy 9, 21. And uh, then it's over the face of water and he forced the Israelites to drink it. So he cast the dust thereof into the brook that descended out of the mount in Deuteronomy 9, 21. So all of this is the same. The only thing that I didn't copy and paste from Deuteronomy 9 is it doesn't mention anything about being forcing the uh, Israelites to drink it that I can remember. Interesting. So then you have Psalms 36, 8. The feast on the abundance of your house, you give them drink from your river of delights. It, it's interesting. Then let's look at what a city is. So a city can be a town, a city. It can be citizenship. It can be uh, townsmen. It can mean to lie. Uh, it can also uh, form words for a bed, a couch. It can mean beloved or dear, like D-E-A-R, dear. Uh, then it goes back to showing a town or a borough. Uh, good reference, city slicker, slick. Uh, if you think of uh, 
Judas Iscariot. Iscariot means city slicker. All right. So the next thing is we're going to compare a city to a cradle, a bed, or a place of rest, since we just looked at that definition on the last slide, or a Sabbath, or an ark. So K, this is also meaning to lie, or a bed, or a couch, or beloved, or dear. So just like the uh, city definition, it forms all or part of these particular words in blue, uh, Salid, cemetery, city, civic, civil, civilian, civilization, civilized, hide, measure of land, incivility, incuna, incunabula, however you say it, incunabula, siva. All right, so it is, it is the hypothetical source of evidence for its existence is provided by Sanskrit, otherwise Siva, uh, propitious, gracious, Greek, kisthai, which means to lie, lie asleep. Latin, cune, or a cradle. So a city can also be a cradle. Think of how uh, when people are doing DNA tests and whatnot, they talk about a cradle of civilization. So, yeah, a cradle. Think of the manger in which Jesus were to lie. If uh, Let's continue real quick. Uh, it can also be domestic servants, a wife, or members of a household. If you look at Exodus 28 through 11, uh, seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. Uh, and he rested on the seventh day. Uh, so uh, it can be a rest day. A city can be a Sabbath. So it can be a reference to a Sabbath, a rest, a place to rest, a place to lie, a cradle. Whenever you think of a cradle, it can also be similar to an ark. Think If you look at that picture, they have a cradle as an ark. Uh, they sent uh, Moses in a river in a ark or a cradle. Uh, Armenia, if you look at it, there's a book known as the Cradle of Civilization about Armenia. Then Mesopotamia was called the Cradle of Civilization. And then there's a, a map also in referencing to the cradle. So let's continue. So here we have Havila again, referencing childbirth and gold and the crystal river of life. So based upon the discovered definitions, let's revert back to Genesis 2.11 and input the definitions. So the name of the first is Pison, Shinar, the land of scattering in many ways. Uh, that is which compasseth the whole land of Havila or childbirth, where there is gold or the cradle of civilization, the crystal river of life. So here we're noticing that whenever they're talking about the uh, river of life, it's in Havla or in childbirth. So whenever we're thinking of heaven and the river of life in Revelation, it's a reference to childbirth. Did you know this? It's interesting. So Python uh, can also be translated to mean circular or motions. Uh, so if you look at it that way, the name of the first is uh, circular motions or Python circular motions. That is which comp compass the whole land. So there's circular motions around the whole land. So uh, circular river maybe. Uh, if you look at the uh, Havila in reference to the picture where it was showing childbirth. It showed circular motions going uh, the, through the tubes to land in a certain place to produce the child. 
Circular motions can also be a reference to winds or the vesic Pisces. Um, it can also be a reference to eternal life. So uh, it can also look further in purple, we'll look at Galilee. So if you look at Galilee, it also has a definition of circle, a circuit, rolling, revolving, a region. So when we think of Galilee, where did Jesus come from? The city of Galilee. Uh, he was born in a manger. Um, it always referenced him coming from a manger in Bethlehem oh, by the Sea of Galilee, the circle of life, the cradle of civilization, the ark. So the region, the boondocks. Let's look at this middle paragraph. Uh, it's talking about Damascus. So the beauty and fertility of the surroundings of Damascus are chiefly due to the abundance of water. This greatest of blessings in a sandy and rocky desert can fit the symbol of life and regeneration. Naaman of old very naturally thought the rivers of Damascus, Abana or Amana and Fapar, far better than all the waters of Israel. This can be found in 2 Kings, verse 12. And uh, they are now called the Barada, the Chrysoris, or Gold River. Interesting, Gold River. This is also in reference to the land of Havilah. So this is Damascus the gold river, the river of life, the crystal river. Um, then if you go down a little bit further, the Abana River, which is now known as the Barada, rises among the Lebanons. So it's also near Lebanon. And the life in the gardens, the beauty of the trees, the charm of the flowers, the green grass, the rich fruits, which distinguish the city of Damascus. It owes to the waters of Abana. And this is also found in Galilee. Interesting. Let's go to the next slide. Now these are pictures in reference to the Barada River, the Damascus, uh, city of Damascus, River of Gold, Havila, Galilee, and Pison. So when you're thinking of Eden, you now have no choice but to think of Galilee and Damascus, the river of life or gold or the clear water, the river of Abana, the Barada River. Keep this in mind, it's in Syria. Mm, Syria. So, interesting. Assyrians. Makes you rethink your uh, geographical maps in relation to Israel, doesn't it? Let's continue. So Isaiah 17, the burden of Damascus. Behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city or a river of life or gold. And it shall be a ruinous or downfall, a waterfall, a heap. Ruinous heap also translates to mean a waterfall. Did you know that? Well, it does. A ruin. Late Old English, act of giving way and falling down. A collapse, a rushing down, a tumbling down, a collapse, a uh, to rush, fall violently, collapse, to smash, knock down, tear out, dig up. Descent from a state of prosperity, degradation, downfall, or decay of a person or society, violent or complete destruction that which causes destruction or downfall. 
and here we have a picture of the falls of Borada, the river of Bonham. Interesting. Let's keep on. Now we have Isaiah 17, the burden of Damascus or Babylon, Shinar, land of scattering. Behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city, gold, river of life, and it shall be a ruinous heap, a waterfall. Uh, Revelation 17, 5. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Damascus, uh, Babylon, the great the mother of harlots and abominations of earth. Why did I call mystery Damascus? So the name Damascus, the summary, meaning the beginning of salvation, uh, if you look in the etymology, it translates to mean a mystery, a period or cycle to draw or draw out. It also translates to uh, reference Adam or Edom. Interesting. Now we're getting to, tied to uh, the name Adam, the first man. Let's continue. Now we have Numbers 11, 7. And the manna, or fig, was as coriander seed, and the color thereof as the color of the delium, amber, or balsam. 8. And the people went about and gathered it and ground it in mills or beat it in a mortar and baked it in pans. Compare this to the burned thoroughly in Genesis 11.3. And then they made cakes of it and the taste of it was as the taste of fresh oil. Compare slime for mortar in Genesis 11.3. Genesis 2. The name of the first is Pisan, 2.11, I mean. That is which compasseth the whole land of Havilah, the circle, Galilee, where there is gold, the river of life, the city, the birth child, the cradle of civilization. And the gold, or cluster, of that land is good. There is bedellium, or balsam, and the onyx, otherwise known as the nail, nail-scarred hands, thank Jesus, uh, stone, brick, manna, fig bread. So let's look at the definition of onyx. I have a few things underlined for onyx. So you'll see that it's a type of quartz, but there's also some other definitions down below that are underlined. A claw, talon, a hook, fingernail, or nail. So called because the mineral's color sometimes resembles that of a human fingernail. So Nail, nail scarred hands. Interesting. Um, Genesis 11:3, and they said to one another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, slime had they for mortar. Exodus 16:31, the house of Israel named it manna, and it was like coriander seed, white, and its taste was like wafers with honey. So I gave you some pictures of what coriander seed looks like and barley seed. And then below it shows you the cover, color of amber in the bottom left of the slide. Then I also have a picture of the fig in the bottom right. So you can see why it mentions the white color of the fig and whatnot. So next slide. So here we go a little bit more into the amber, the bedellium, balsamic, vinegar oil. So slime. Slime can also be translated to mean spittle or smooth or to anoint. Think anoint with oil. And it can also translate to mean mire, uh, like the miry clay. Think of that. Uh, mire can also be another version of myrrh, M-Y. R-R-H. So myrrh is used to make perfume or oil. Think of this amber, bedellium, balsamic, vinegar, oil. Think of Galilee, balms of Gilead, so on. So Leviticus 2, 1 and 2. Uh, now when anyone presents a grain offering, as an offering to the Lord, his offering shall be of 
fine flour and he shall pour oil on it and put frankincense on it. He shall then bring it to Aaron's sons, the priest, and shall take from it his handful of its fine flour and of its oil with all of its frankincense and the priest shall offer it up in smoke as its memorial portion on the altar an offering by what fire of a soothing aroma to the Lord here's this offering a burnt offering again a grain offering oil offering uh, frankincense fine flour all this back in reference to the golden calf and the uh, making the Israelites to drink the water and stuff numbers 11 1 and when the people complained it displeased the Lord and the Lord heard it and in his anger was kindled and the fire of the Lord burnt among them so here you have the fire of the Lord burning among them so a burn Oh, it's it's continuous then let's look at balsam in the top right hand corner doesn't it look like the color of amber um, if you look in the bottom right corner there's another picture of balsam so next slide now we get to the Tower of Babel where it's talking about Genesis 11 to 4 so now after having defined such terms as shinar, brick, stone, slime, and mortar, one might look at the Tower of Babel story uh, and think of a little something different. So let's look at shinar again, scattering, being torn to pieces, stone, a manna, or fig bread, uh, slime for mortar, or balsamic vinegar oil, myrrh, frankincense, burn thoroughly, also meaning baked in pans. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 23 and 24, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken, for you, this do in remembrance of me. Shinar, torn to pieces, broken body of Jesus. Breaking of bread, you'll see a picture of bread in the bottom right. So, it's interesting that the Tower of Babel story can now be seen as the Last Supper story interesting Babel gate of God it can also mean to mix with oil unto saturation and it's also another version of Abel or Jubilee notice how the name Babel is likened to the name Abel the brother of Cain who is slain and the Jubilee Micah 4:10. be in pain and labor to bring forth here's that childbirth again O daughter of Zion, like a woman in travail, for now shalt thou go forth out of the city. Here, man of city, think of uh, Judas Iscariot, Iscariot, man of the city, out of the city. And thou shalt dwell in the field. Judas acquired a field, and he hung himself in it. It's known as the field of blood. And thou shalt go leaven to Babylon. Oh, go even. Sorry, I thought that said leaven. It was in parentheses. Go even to Babylon. Uh, the Jubilee, the anointing with oil. Jesus was wrapped with spices and oil, myrrh and frankincense. There shalt thou be delivered. There the Lord shall redeem thee from the hand of thine enemies. That's Micah 4.10. That's a true prophecy of Jesus' death. Proverbs 18.10. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. Babel. 
the righteous runneth into it and is safe. Compare Genesis 11:4, making a city and a tower, making a name as to prevent being scattered. So we see the making of the bread and wine and the making of brick and slime. And they make a name, city, as to prevent being torn to pieces. Uh, if this doesn't sound familiar, it's a reference to Judas Iscariot. Uh, Iscariot. The meaning of Iscariot is man of Kiriot, or man of the cities, or city slicker. So Acts 1.18. Now this man acquired a field. Think of the plain of Shinar with the price of his weakness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his intestines gushed out. Think of land of scattering, Shinar. Jesus being speared in the side, and Judas's intestines falling out references the canopic jar process in embalming. So now we're, con not only have we're connected to the Last Supper process, but now we're connected to the embalming process of the Egyptians. Now here comes Egyptians into play. And those are pictures of some example uh, embalming uh, jars for the stomach, intestines, lungs, and so on. And this is a picture of the embalming process. So you'll see how they are wrapped. Uh, the, they, it goes in steps one through, I think, eight. Uh, purify the body, remove the internal organs. Then, uh, so when you're pur purifying the body, you, uh, before the embalming process can begin, the body is washed in water from the Nile and palm wine. So Jesus, if you think before Jesus was crucified, they washed their hands. Uh, and water on uh, this was Pilate. He washed his hands in water, and uh, then he also drunk of wine before he died. So he was off for wine twice. So two, remove the internal organs. A small incision is made in the left side of the body and the liver, lungs, intestines, and stomach are removed. Then they are washed and packed in natron, or salt water, uh, before being placed in canopic jars. The heart is left in the body, as it is believed to be the center of intelligence, and will be needed in the afterlife. Three, they discard the brain. A rod is inserted through the nostril into the skull and used to break apart the brain so that it can be drained out of the nose. The liquid is then thrown away as it is not thought to be useful. Now, I want you to think about Leviathan. And they talk about a hook in the jaws of Leviathan. Well. It is a hook that is used to drag out the brains from the skull. Four, you leave to dry. The body is stuffed and covered with natron, a type of salt which will absorb any moisture. It is then left for 40 days to dry out. Now we're getting into the 40 days and 40 nights. This is the reference to the days of the flood. Five, stuff the body. Once again, it is washed in water from the Nile and covered with oils to help the skin stay elastic. The natron is scooped out and the body is then stuffed with sawdust and linen to make it look lifelike. Then you have six, wrap in linen. First, the head and neck are wrapped in strips of linen then the fingers and toes. The arms and legs are wrapped separately before being tied together. Liquid resin is used as glue. Then they add amulets. Charms called amulets are placed in between the layers and then they're also used to protect the body during its journey to the afterlife. And then they say prayers. 
Now, one thing they also uh, didn't mention is uh, the 70 days uh, at, are mentioned in Genesis, the last chapter of Genesis. I think it's like 50, I don't remember what the last chapter of Genesis is off the top of my head. But, uh, yeah, it's like 51 or 50, 52, maybe. I don't know. But they talk about there being 40 days, then 70 days, so a total of a 110-day process. And this 110 days is a reference to the death of Joshua, which is another name for Jesus or Yeshua. It's also a reference to the death, death of Joseph, which is another version of Joshua or Jesus. Now, there's another thing about the 110 days that's tied to a prophecy in the Bible known as the 2300-day prophecy, where it 2300 days is a total of six 365-day years plus 110 days. So, it's uh, an ending. So, this is the interesting part that they're all tied to uh, Jesus, they're all tied to the unleavened bread ceremony, the making of unleavened bread, and it's all tied to the uh, embalming process as well. Uh, it's all related to things that are real and follow a direct numerical origin. Um, it also has definitions to go along with each other. I bet you didn't know that the Bible could be seen this way using the definitions of names in the Bible. From the Bible. Uh, you're looking up their or origins. So keep this in mind whenever you're studying in the future because it is important to look at every angle whenever you're studying the Bible to see if you have the true meaning. And I believe in looking up true meanings. So I hope this uh, study has reached you and you enjoyed listening. Thank you for watching.